they say. So I'm absolutely delighted today. Dr. Dom Thompson um, up there in the corner who I can see uh, is going to be our, yay, is going to be our special presenter today. Dom um, is an expert in student financial health. Um, there is nothing that uh, is important to know that Dom doesn't know about this subject. No, no pressure there, um, no pressure there, Dom. Um, she's also written a book. We were gonna be giving away two of her books um, at the end. So Dom's a GP and on behalf of the country, Dom, thank you for all the work that you've been doing um, in terms of vaccinations and the like. Um, she's a young, um, a young people's mental health expert, TEDx, author, educator, all round fabulous human being, um, 20 years of clinical experience caring for students. Um, Dom is the author of the Student Wellbeing Series, um, a series of short uh, guides, little books um, for young people 16 to 25 around mental health, well-being and life at university, and also co-authored How to Grow a Grown-Up which is uh, the book that we are going to be giving away. Um, Dom is the chapter author of Student Mental Health and Wellbeing in Higher Education. So she really knows what she's talking about. Um, we are absolutely delighted that she is such a, um, such a friend to Black Bullion and brings her expertise um, to us and to our audience. So I'm gonna shut up now and hand over to somebody far more interesting than me. So Dr. Dominique Thompson, thank you so much for being with us and over to you, the con is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Vivi. That was lovely. And um, so my, my interest is student mental health. Financial health is sort of a little piece of that, but not, uh, not something that we any of us, I don't think, yet know so much about that we can't always learn a bit more. So what I'm going to do is go to my slides and um, hoping if Vivi gives me the thumbs up, I'll assume all is well there. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. So it's an interesting topic and one that I think um, is really overdue a little bit more spotlight, but it's a fantastic opportunity to start to think about something that's quite a complex relationship. So let's crack on. You've heard a bit about me. I won't say too much more, just that I did sit in that chair at the bottom there for nearly 20 years looking after students at the University of Bristol um, every 10 minutes. And it's so interesting about how the change occurred over those years, seeing more and more and more young people with stress, distress, mental health issues than when I first started. So that's how I developed my, my interest in mental health of young people. That's what's led me to write the books and do TEDx talks. And today we're going to talk a little bit more specifically um, about three things and how they interact essentially. So we're gonna cover mental health, and how it relates in particular to risk taking. And of course, the angle that we're gonna look at today is money and mental health and risk taking. And another way to think about it is like this. For me, um, we'll talk as we go through about how these things overlap with each other. So we'll talk about risk and mental health and money and mental health, but the bit, I guess, the crux of the talk will be where the all three overlap in the middle and if I was better with PowerPoint I'd have managed to colour in that little tiny <laughs> spot but I'm not so we'll move on I have other strengths I'm sure um, okay so when we think about um, students and money just to put a little bit of sort of background into this um, uh, essentially we talk about you know how they worry about their their living costs or the costs of the course um, there have been a few studies done. I have to say it's an area where there isn't huge amounts of really good evidence and uh, in terms of, you know, published papers and science, but there are some studies out there and it's interesting to look at just how many students believe, for example, that mental health had, had suffered because of their money worries. I mean, these are big numbers of students who are to some degree stressed. It may not be the level of stress that causes um, an actual mental health problem, but in many, many students' lives, it plays a big part. It can, of course, lead them to drop out. Um, the, one of the studies I managed to find showed that it is interestingly not how much debt that then leads to how much mental health from how many mental health problems they have, if you like. It's not the bigger the debt, the bigger the problem. It's a much more complicated relationship. In fact, students who we might think don't really have significant um, debt, for example, could be very, very stressed about that. So it's important to remember it's a complicated relationship. 
And unfortunately, as, as I think quite a lot of us are aware, the pandemic has made things worse. So it is definitely a very topical subject. What are we aiming for when we talk about good mental health? I think it's always helpful. And I think you probably always know this, but when I'm talking to students or sixth formers, when I do my various talks, I'm quite careful to emphasize we're not aiming to feel happy all the time. It's about feeling well and functioning well, being able to do the things that we need to do each day to get some enjoyment out of them, but you know, that we're not gonna feel happy all the time, but we do need to feel well enough to do those things like study and pass exams and so on. Um, and sometimes, you know, and it's okay, we need a bit of help to be well and to stay well, but it change, it can change every day uh, we, how we feel, obviously. So the next thing I'm gonna cover is the bit about risk. Um, I've, I've, I always find this bit quite interesting when I read books about um, the brain and uh, neurobiology, but what I'm gonna do is just, um, for me, I like things to be nice and simple. I'm a GP, I like things to be simple that I can explain them, hopefully in the space of a 10 minute appointment. So I'm just gonna pick out some of the things that are absolutely fascinating about risk-taking behaviors because it perhaps gives us a little bit more insight <laughs> into those moments where we think you did what and, and why did you? And I'm, not, I'm finding it hard to get my head around what a student has perhaps done. And obviously I'm never gonna say, that, say those things out loud to them in a non-judgmental way, I might say, that's an interesting choice, um, but I would, I would want to understand myself to help me uh, frame some of those behaviours a little bit better. So, although here I am perhaps thinking of students who are in their up to sort of late 20s, so this is because the brain is developing all the way through until our late 20s. Um, obviously there are older students and obviously they do sometimes um, take risks as well for similar reasons, but it's particularly fascinating in the sort of late teens and early 20s what happens and why we take these risks. So basically when we take a risk, when we do something um, that makes us have that rush of adrenaline and feel excited or thrilled, Basically, our brains light up like Christmas trees, especially when we're young. And that sadly happens much less when we're older. So imagine you're in your early teens going through to your mid 20s. When you do something exciting, you get a, a genuine physiological rush, a real lighting up. Um, and here's an interesting little statistic that I just thought I'll throw in anyway. The age at which we get the most rush and excitement and the least ability to dampen it down or control it because the bit of the brain that needs is needed there hasn't grown yet is 14.38 years. So if you have a year 10 kid, <laughs> good luck. Uh, but basically, um, as our brains develop, we're still getting that rush and that excitement, um, but the prefrontal bit of the brain, which develops last, is the bit that develops by the time we're in our late 20s. So, as we're going through our late teens into being a student, we are feeling impulsive, we're going to take risks, we're going to perhaps have some poor decision making, maybe, I mean this is all dependent on the individual, but we don't always have the ability to dampen that down and to sort of delay those, those emotions. And so that may be why at those ages we see some of this behavior where as we get older, we think, really? Um, with students, obviously, I mean, these are not gonna be new to you. There's a whole host of different things that can lead to the risk-taking behaviors and that give them potentially those, um, the thrill and the excitement, but also, as we're going to see, we use risk for other reasons too. So yes, we might see them using the sort of things that we think of as drugs, like everyday um, recreational drugs, but we also see them making not terribly healthy decisions about using things like um, modafinil, which is to help you stay awake a really long time, usually only prescribed for narcolepsy. Um, where you fall asleep in, in uh, strange ways, at strange moments. So we see students making decisions that perhaps aren't terribly healthy um, for lots of reasons and in all these different sort of ways. And, you know, 
you might think, well, if, if, if there's danger involved, other than the fun of it, because it can be a distraction or a thrill or make them feel brave, it's also used, risk taking is also used, obviously, as a way to cope. And it, although it isn't necessarily a healthy strategy, it is a strategy and it is a regular, very human strategy. You know, who hasn't reached for, you know, the bottle of wine or in my case, the Pringles at the end of a day that's been stressful? You know, we all do it as humans. And so whilst um, we may wish that they didn't make those choices, we have to understand that sometimes that is what felt like the right thing to do at that time to distract themselves from something very difficult. Um, then, of course, there are things like uh, conditions specific perhaps uh, conditions associated with types of psychosis, so bipolar disorder or psychosis um, such as schizophrenia, where students, and I've certainly seen a few students do this over the many years I was working at Student Health, where risk taking is, is sort of unfortunately part of how they are at that moment when they're having a difficult time. Um, so we've certainly seen risk taking around um, sexual behaviors, but also around money, um, and I've certainly seen students who have come to see me because uh, possibly after the episode or their flatmates have pointed out to them what's happened, they have spent huge amounts of money on something and it might be part of their delusion at the time. For example, I had a student who felt that he had created a piece of music that would solve the world's problems um, and he spent enormous amounts of money on musical related things so instruments and so on and of course that can be a very difficult situation uh, when they especially when they don't have the money so it's just really important to bear in mind that we you know when risk taking happens it is sometimes to not in their control or it may be to cope with difficult times um just, I mean, this may be saying the obvious, so I just thought it was helpful just though to list why, why risk-taking behaviours can matter, what the outcomes can be. Obviously, there can be sometimes good outcomes, but mostly um, there can be some quite difficult ones. Um, these are things that I've certainly seen throughout my career as a GP, uh, unfortunately, because of some of the risk-taking behaviours. And the one at the end there, the financial loss and debt, is what we're going to talk a bit more about in a second. So this slide is really just that little interaction, as I was saying, well, not so much little, but, but the interaction here, the overlap between risk and mental health. So uh, we'll come to money in a second, but if you are someone who is looking after working with students of all different sorts, and you notice some of these signs, it's worth thinking about um, what's going on, you know, of course, deeper in their lives, what's going on behind the scenes. It may be something relatively broad, like their behaviors just become a bit more erratic their moods are changing you know you've been seeing them regularly but recently they've just seemed off they're not sleeping so well then perhaps not turning up for things that you would have expected um so i have spoken to to tutors of course and um other members of staff who look after students who said to me you know they actually came they look really glassy eyed or i was pretty sure they were slurring and i you know, I was just concerned about them, you know, so they phoned me immediately after the session to say, like, what, what do I do? Because obviously they can follow it up, but they weren't 100% sure. Um, so if you notice things, I mean, some of them perhaps will be obvious, um, like you might spot some injuries, uh, self-inflicted um, on their forearms, for example, or they might be covering up their forearms when the weather is really hot. So there are lots of things that may just make you think, hmm, something may be going on here. And I'm, what I can do is check in with them and ask them how they are. Um, but certainly if there are persistent or consistent changes, um, that is when you should definitely be concerned. Now, to talk a little bit about the overlap between money and mental health, um, it's a two way street. Uh, I mean, again, you might sort of automatically think, well, yeah, if you don't have, you know, money or you have money worries, that's going to have an impact on your mental health. But also, of course, if you have uh, an underlying mental health condition, you may really struggle to be able to deal with your money to keep on top of your bills to be able to pay your rent on time so it's this very complicated 
Um, and sometimes a real downward spiral can occur. So the, the, the issues of debt and mental health issues, they often go hand in hand. With students, we're well aware of lots of the ways that um, they can get into these sorts of difficulties. And I'm gonna put up a slide in a sec of some of the other ones as well. But it's certainly something that seems to have become to me a bigger issue or something that people talk about much more in the last five to 10 years that I was working as a GP um, with students coming much more often, you know, having hit uh, a wall of, of an insurmountable problem, not knowing where to turn. Perhaps they buried their head in the sand, but of course we need them to learn these life skills around money and um, to take back the control so that, the, the, you know, the money and the issues are not controlling them. And I always try and get that message across to them that whilst it is complicated, it can be managed and not to ignore it. And there are some brilliant websites we know about Black Bullion, that's certainly on one of my later slides, but there are others as well if students want to have a look around for sort of just lots of different bits of advice. The impact there, so I was just mentioning how it can affect mental health and it's this, this difficult two-way street, but, but money worries can really affect students in terms of, you know, they might feel shame and guilt and unable to come and, and talk about it for quite some time, perhaps until they really reach a crisis point. They, they often don't sleep because of it, or they can get very angry and irritable. It can lead them then to have relationship issues, work and study problems, and it can even impact their physical health if they're not sleeping or if they're not going outside or exercising or doing all the things they should be. Um, or if, of course, they're, they're drinking to deal with their money issues, those sorts of things can impact their physical health as well. So it can be a really... Um, sort of intricate problem to have to sort out, but it is fixable, it can be sorted, of course. Now with students in particular, the student lifestyle leads to all sorts of challenges financially. So I've just list listed some of the ones that students would tell me about and that are kind of, um, perhaps some of them are more obvious, like the fact that they've got, you know, um, debt in terms of uh, fees and also travel related, you know, to their course. That can often be a real worry for them, their living daily costs. But sometimes there's that feeling, you know, you arrive at university um, and perhaps the, you know, if you'd been at a particular school, you know, everybody had maybe a similar lifestyle and suddenly you arrive at university and you're trying to keep up with other people and, you know, it might be that the, the person you're sharing a flat with, you know, they drive a BMW or they, they talk about their holidays somewhere glamorous. And for some students that in itself can be a real pressure. They don't want to stand out. They don't want to be too different. So there are those sorts of impacts. And they might try to spend money on others, which you, know, you can understand where that's coming from. They want their friends to like them, but they don't have that money to spend. And then I've seen very specific issues around health, but these are not to be um, you know, sniffed at in the sense that uh, with health costs, I've often seen students when I've handed them a prescription, they've said, is this gonna cost me money? I said, well, unfortunately in England in particular, and it's different in, in Wales, for example, if in Bristol, they could cross the border back to Wales if that's where they came from. But you know, a prescription in the UK it is not automatically free if you're a student, I'd see students say, well, I can't get the antidepressants then, I can't get those pills to help me with my anxiety or whatever we decided finally might be useful for them. Um, so, you know, whether it's that or even getting to appointments if they have to go to a hospital, these things can impact them negatively because they'll just decide not to do it. Um, so it's really worth being aware. And we've talked a little bit about some of the impacts that their health conditions can inter interact with money. So of course, if you have an addiction or something like that, you might be spending money you don't have to spare, but also um, young people with anorexia can have things like food guilt and feel they don't deserve to buy food. I've certainly looked after two or three young ladies in particular with that, that particular food guilt where they felt they weren't de deserving of uh, or worthy of spending money on and they would worry about that. So, you know, these are really, really, tricky and challenging issues and it is so important that we're talking about them. So we've got to that slide, um, yeah, basically where I couldn't colour in the middle bit, <laughs> where risk and mental health and money overlap. Uh, for students, this is in particular, I mean obviously in life there are many, many places. These are the sorts of things that I, that I was hearing about 
both when I was working three or four years ago with students every day, but also now when I talk to them in slightly different uh, ways. So I might go and give a talk or I'm asked to, you know, come and do um, a workshop with them or I just sit around and chat to young people. And so gambling, I mean, that's been around for a while, but uh, as you'll see from my case history, it can have absolutely devastating impacts. The whole things that, that perhaps a little bit new, and certainly I've no expert, but I've certainly learned a bit more in the sense that this is what young people are talking about. Um, just last week, having a conversation with some 20 somethings where dealing in cryptocurrencies is kind of, well, everybody's doing it. And I was just frightened for them, perhaps because I don't understand it. But but I just thought, am I just so out of touch? But they were saying, well, it's not gambling. And I thought, then you don't understand <laughs> what gambling is. And it's this really interesting view that a lot of and I have to say, very bright, very interesting, engaged young people have. And I, so it's a whole maybe other talk, but I'm worried by the way that these things are viewed perhaps more than anything, um, because I have seen the impact that they can have when they lose money. And, um, you know, all, we go back to that guilt, that shame, that lo loss of sleep and so on. Um, and then I guess the other aspect of this, again, not to go into in those details, but I have looked after students who have tried to earn money in high risk ways. And of course, I'm not just talking about, for example, with gambling, I'm talking about occasionally um, sex work and things like that. And, you know, it is it is just terrifying to, to know that that feels like the only option sometimes for, for young people. So, you know, we do have to bear in mind that these can have real repercussions. Just a quick case history, not going to go into loads of details, but Mo came to see me. He was a medical student. The only reason he came, I guess these things always uh, have to result in a crisis sometimes for some people to seek help. But, you know, his background as a medical student meant that he was not really able to find, you know, part time work that paid well. He came from a low income family, first in his family to, to go to university. And he was just desperately looking around for ways to, to earn some money. A flatmate had said to him that, you know, he happened to have won a bit of money on some horse um, racing. So Mo thought, well, you know, that's not difficult and I can do that anytime. And it just, for him, it just felt like that maybe that would work. And the thing is, you know, they start with a small bet. We all know the story, but what they never, uh, you know, once they go down that spiral, perhaps come back to is, you know, that the house always <laughs> wins essentially. So he was gambling more and more and he, he came to see me actually only at the point where he failed all his second year exams and it was a kind of I'm going to be asked to leave unless I can get a medical note or I can explain what's happened or I can make some changes and that's when we started to dig, dig into this and you know it is it is so devastating you know the students have worked so hard to get to where they are whatever course they're doing they've come from sometimes really difficult backgrounds and you sort of see the logic of how they thought oh this this will work <laughs> And it's all about, as I said before, the impulsivity, the poor decision making. They don't always have that bit of the brain that yet can kind of be the the, the break, the handbrake on some of these, um, you know, not, it's not the thrill seeking. He honestly thought this was a way to make money um, and he just found it really hard to stop. So if you're worried, if you're worried about a student, remember, it's not about blame. We're trying to support them, of course. I know that I'm sure you wouldn't be blaming them, but just to understand that we need to be compassionate. There can be some really complex stuff going on. If there's somebody who just needs, uh, you know, that adrenaline rush and actually they are just looking for thrills, um, then get them to try, you know, other adrenaline seeking. So trampolining, go-karting, I mean, maybe as a GP, I shouldn't be recommending those, but you know, I think they're probably slightly safer than some of these things. Um, but it's about, you know, talking to a colleague about it, obviously with their consent, um, if you're worried about them, but helping them to find the life skills to deal with money and risk and their mental health, because this is not going to be a one-off thing. So I just want to put in a couple of slides I put into all my talks, because these for me are kind of almost the most important if someone comes to talk to you and they are really worried really stressed just remember three things okay no special training and you know is required for this just three things listen believe and give them hope so you might be that first person they've spoken to and if you you know perhaps don't give them that full kind of open listening taking it seriously that that validation that what they're going through really is difficult because we think really <laughs> did you get into this or oh it'll be okay it's not so bad you know 
it's about hearing them where they are now and understanding that is how they're experiencing it. So we have to go from there to wherever we're going to help them get to. And then giving hope because some people come when it's absolute crisis point, but they often feel very, very trapped and very, very on the edge of perhaps doing something um, that could be, you know, very dangerous to them and so on. So giving them that glimmer of hope, we all sometimes just need that light at the end of the tunnel and just saying something like, okay, this sounds really difficult, but I think we can help you with this. I feel optimistic that we can, you know, move you away from where things are. Sometimes that's what people need to hear just at the beginning. And then, you know, we can look at more specific resources, which I'll get to in a minute. So it's just allowing them to recognize that what, what they're feeling is is valid and true and that you know if you're not even sure how to bring it up you know they've come in a bit glassy eyed or or you think god they're just really odd behavior recently start with something like you know about them you know I, i've noticed that you're you know you seem um, not yourself recently i'm worried about you um do you want to talk about it and just leave it very open and even if at that point they say no no, no i'm fine do you know what? It'll have registered that you're interested. They'll come back. They'll know that you're a safe place to come back to if they want to. And the other thing that is so important, because for me, uh, well, we've dealt with too many um, student suicides over the years, and it's felt like perhaps we need to say something whenever we get an opportunity, even if that wasn't how they came in or, you know, we're not sure what's going on for them, just to say, just to make it really, really clear that nothing is off limits and that there's nothing I wouldn't want to talk about or hear about or help you with. And I'm here to listen. I want to support you. And I say that because so, so many uh, of the young people who come in when they are desperate or unfortunately do take their own lives, there was a feeling for them that they've let us know afterwards that they just couldn't talk to anyone, that no one would want to hear this, no one could help them. And I just think if we put it out there earlier, it might be the thing that allows them to speak. And you know, even if you don't know how to fix it all with them, that's okay. You can help them to find someone who has. So I just think it is so important. I always put these slides in. It matters that we say this. So just to recap, you know, if you're looking at ways to reduce financial risk on student mental health, I would say go with three approaches. That message, you know, it happens. Uh, you're not alone. Um, it's so important to normalize it. And by normalize, I'm always very careful how I use that word. That doesn't mean saying it's normal. It means, of course, saying this is not uncommon. If you, if you do say it's normal, if we say it's normal, it can sound a bit dismissive. I know you wouldn't do that. So it's just about saying it happens. It's really important that they get the education around money. Um, I mean, just especially these days, but it could not be more important. And then of course, providing resources. So you might wanna do, I know we don't do posters anymore, but you know, on your TV screens, those PDFs that come up, you know, in between when they're sitting in waiting areas or in a, in a waiting room or something, uh, something about, you know, you've got money worries, you know, you're not alone. And this is where you can check out more information and then signpost to your own resources, of course, the universities, um, finance advisors, or to other external ones. Loads of other resources are out there in general for mental health. I've obviously put at the bottom there three specific ones about financial health, financial mental health. But of course, there are some brilliant apps and resources. There are some free apps like the Student Health app or the Distract app, both of which I've helped to develop, both of which are free. And uh, the Distract app actually won the BMA Patient Award last year. Um, there are some brilliant websites out there like the Student Minds and Student Space website. If you haven't had the opportunity to look at What's Up With Everyone, the new Ardman website about young people's well-being, please do have a look. I'm very proud to have been part of that team, but um, it's just a brilliant uh, website with five short animations about mental health and well-being for young people. Um, but of course, there are loads of resources out there. Um, if young people and, and students generally need some signposting, you can signpost to lots. Oh, and my hashtag Dom in 60 seconds YouTube videos, they're literally just one minute videos on YouTube of me talking about lots of different useful things. 
So I'll stop there. I think I'm pretty much in time. If there's anything that you want to, you know, follow up, do email me and follow me on the social media. Uh, but basically, I'm now happy to uh, stop screen sharing and we can do some questions. That's wonderful, Dom. Thank you so much. And please do chuck your questions into the uh, into the chat function. Um, while people are getting their fingers all stretchy, um, let's kind of ask a little bit of the the kind of the obvious um, co post COVID, still in COVID, who knows what any of this is, you know, where we're at in Freedom Day and everything else that's kind of going on. We know that isolation and lockdowns and quarantines have been a real challenge um, for, for young people. And, and this is a generation that's already isolated and already more lonely and all of these things are already there. As we start to go into recovery from kind of the restrictions, what is this going to look like for students and how can staff kind of shift during that transition period? Because it's going to be very shaky ground, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really difficult at the moment. I mean, I'm I'm getting contacts most weeks from, from parents of young people. I had one this morning from a parent of a 20-year-old who's just not leaving his room last few days ago it was a 15 year old you know we may be saying that things will be getting back to normal but not all young people in fact most of us recognize it's not it's not actually getting back to normal of course but for young people who have been you know potentially the most impacted in mental health terms by the last 18 months they are still very nervous about those social interactions the social situations um, so I've when I've talked about the sort of three or four things that are really on young people's minds at the moment, I'm grouping it as social, the social gap, the social skills gap. They're worried not only about actually coming into contact with people, but they think they've forgotten how to connect with other people. They're worried they don't know how to talk to other people. So they're really worried. So anything we can do to help them connect, to get them chatting about shared interests or connecting them, you know, online and in person when possible will be brilliant for them them um, then they're worried about their academic skills gap because they kind of feel like well I don't know what I don't know and what I've missed so they they're really worrying about you know will they be behind and you know I hope that universities especially will sh sort of reassure them about that aspect that there's help available study skills and so on and then they're still worried not surprisingly they say you know we're still worried about the future you know climate change hasn't gone away and Black Lives Matter still matter. And, you know, all of that stuff still going on for them, as well as the fact that there's COVID and a pandemic and a potential recession, which they, they worry about and not getting jobs and so on. So, you know, they've had a pretty rough time. They weren't doing great before, unfortunately. And now we need to think about, right, how do we help them to move forwards, to help them to connect with other people, which is the best thing that we can always do to help our mental health. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm reading the new Norena Hertz book, um, The Century of Loneliness, if anyone hasn't read it. I'm only 50 pages in, so I'm recommending it based on the first 50 pages. Um, but this idea that, that one in four young people can't name a single friend is just devastating um, it really is and if you don't have a community around you then how do you you know how do you move forward and I think what you say leans a little bit into what Jim Dickinson who did our very 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 first webinar back at the beginning of, um, of COVID who said that certain amount of remote learning may continue but actually what happens to the third space what happens how do you remote socialize how do you remote the student experience you can you can learn remotely and certainly some students we have to say prefer it mm. in class but actually you can't socialize remotely it's it's impossibly difficult do you have any thoughts about how universities can kind of approach that third space of uh, of the student experience being you know potentially more digital than than it ever has been and not something universities have, have ever really looked at. Any any kind of thoughts? Well, I mean, it, it's so difficult to, to generalise a bit, only because I've heard this week, uh, so I think in the news, one university was declaring it was going to be mainly online. I think it might have been Manchester, but I might be wrong there. Then I heard another university on the grapevines going full all in person and then lots of places saying we're going to be um, mixed you know which um, I, I get so you know wherever we can connecting people in person and that might to start with because of these social nerves if you like that young people and students generally have will need to be in small groups um, I always think you know finding a shared aim or a shared interest is brilliant 
volunteering amazing for making people feel better but also having the shared interest and meeting people so you know there are ways that universities can get people to connect and you might start that online if if you have to but anything you can then move into face to face safely is is going to be the right direction one of the things that was fascinating from the start of the research that's starting to come out of the Ardman animation so this website with its five animations has been shared um, on, online since february and it's had literally millions of um interactions the two most looked at of the five animations are loneliness and perfectionism and i think that says so much about the whole generation this is worldwide but you know mainly obviously based around the uk so i think loneliness is a real worry for them and we are not just going to suddenly see them all run out of their rooms and say woohoo i'm back it just isn't going to happen like that no, I would agree. And I think we've been losing the skill as a as a species. We've been losing the skill to create human connections. And I don't want to be constantly bashing on social media. I think social media has got some positives. But what you were saying in terms of um, in terms of kind of what we used to call keeping up with the Joneses, which is now called influencer marketing, right? And this is now a standard part of a university student's lifetime. And, and this has been a long-term problem. And like so many things, COVID has accelerated and amplified. It hasn't created new problems. It has simply amplified and accelerated existing um, issues, you know, existing issues. We've got a couple of questions which has come in, so which is which is great. Um, so Anne um, asking student society, oh, saying student societies and sports clubs are part of our way of connecting people um yeah we like the sports stuff right get the endorphin well and just getting act active you know because i'm aware not all students can necessarily do sports sport but but they you know they can be active i've i've heard people talk about it as joyful movement i just think you know it's that thing of again being connected with others but you know doing something together is less intimidating for some than you know just trying to sit and have a new conversation like you're on some sort of blind date <laughs> worst and this is where having a bit of money is also helpful right because mm -hmm. you can do there's a lot of free things and sometimes though the people that are the people that you want to connect with might be doing things that might require a little bit of money and, and that leads into kind of what you were saying um david has a, has a question as students have had less access to things such as nightclubs and pubs over the past year and a half have they started to find new vices other than the recreational substance that used to be often used nicely nicely put there david what are your thoughts dom um it's really interesting isn't it i mean i think it's it's been a year where perhaps many not everybody i mean obviously i'm trying to generalize a little bit just to make it simpler but a lot of young people have perhaps used food in ways that have been less healthy so some we've seen so many more eating issues so eating disorders starting that are that are new essentially they weren't there before but because everything else felt out of control that felt like the thing that they could control so they started to control it and others have put on lots of weight you know there was all that sitting around watching netflix and so on so i think you know in terms of unhealthy coping strategies which is what i was addressing earlier yes you know uh, david um food is definitely one of them um, I think, I mean, alcohol has has been useful to those who have been uh, allowed in terms of le legally allowed to use it in in an unhealthy way. Um, I remember a friend of mine who's a GP locally, and uh, she was seeing a patient who is a uh, refuse collector saying he had never seen and um, collected so many alcohol empties as he, in his whole career, this is an older chap. Um, as he had in the last year and it was it was just like a sort of very unscientific but interesting reflection on how households were coping around um you know around well bristol certainly the country uh, potentially so um yes i think unhealthy coping strategies have have been used um but yes i mean we're, we're just going to need to deal with those as and when they present themselves or, or get ahead of them if we can you know if, if we want to put stuff out there that says have you been struggling with you know food or uh, alcohol or whatever and, and get them to come forward in in the new term when we can offer support yeah a anecdotally i've noticed in our recycling in my building the 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 number of bottles now and and cans is is yeah. huge i mean huge yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
really interesting. Um, Lucy saying here at York, we've had success running online craft sessions, which I absolutely love that. Use your hands. It's just fantastic. Um, I love that. I wanted to um, to swing past Dom to what you were saying about crypto. Obviously, we have at Black Bullion a particular interest in, in some of these kind of newfangled, um, if we can be such an old, you know, old person to say, some of these newfangled kind of ways of, of people putting money into, fi into financial tools. Um, and and surveys are kind of showing 25% of students started to put money into crypto during the during the pandemic. 50% of students now own some sort of crypto. I was having a quick look. Bitcoin is down 6% today, um, like not even over a period, like just today. Um, and we know that that's a concern. Um, what what are your kind of thoughts about these mechanisms being partly about earning money, but partly as an escape? element right you're doing it on your phone you're doing it in your bedroom you're doing it while you're in isolation what are your thoughts about how university staff who already have such a difficult job to, to kind of address this in a more broad kind of manner across across the institution any any thoughts on that yeah and actually that takes me back to i think it was david who asked about other vices i mean i i should have said um that the, the online gaming gambling and so on have you know have Anecdotally, certainly, I've uh, heard and seen many more people worried about that in, in their family um, environments. Um, in terms of what we can do, look, I think the thing about uh, people, I'm talking about young people basically under the age of 30, only because, you know, um, as we get older, that there are certainly most students are sort of still under the age of 30, although I'm not excluding others, of course. Um, they, they see this. Uh, as I said, as, as relatively safe somehow. And some of them are sort of saying, oh, well, I would never, you know, invest, they do rather than bet, uh, more than I can afford to lose. But I'm thinking, can you really afford to lose any of it? Um, so, so I think that's where education comes in and that, and the normalization, I'm not saying it's okay, saying it happens. So to get the conversation started, because I think part of this, it's <clears throat> reasonably new, uh, conversation still even though it's been maybe the last few years to really open it out and kind of expose that conversation and maybe do some campaigns around that stuff because there's always this feeling for a lot of young people they don't realize how many other people you know are doing this and what's happened for them or the ways that it can go wrong and even when I was seeing people with things that we would consider really like run-of-the-mill mental health like anxiety which is the most common thing we literally see walking in the door every day. And they would say, oh, I didn't realize other people felt like this. And I'm not laughing, I'm just saying, you know, it's literally every other student will be sitting down saying, oh, I didn't realize. And I'm thinking, I saw your flatmate three minutes ago. You know, it's that kind of, they're not talking to each other in the way that we think and assume they will. So maybe we just need to be much more out there with the messaging about if you're getting into this, at least, you know, learn about it and frame it and, um you know in a way that they understand that it is a risk and it is when they say to me it's not gambling I think oh it's just terrifying <laughs> you don't understand um so I, I I think that perhaps because of the way it's sold or pushed and marketed they don't see it as they would going into a betting shop or you know something a bit seedy they see it as exciting and you know wall street and I don't know I'm being naff now but you know they see it as that sort of thing but they don't understand necessarily that it is gambling. Absolutely. And we've had we've seen a big spike in the number of people who've accessed our cryptocurrency learning on the platform, which is interesting. We started running a, um, a, a Instagram campaign called Money Confessions. We do it, uh, I think, once once a month, once every couple of months, yeah. um, where it's literally students message us with a confession and we then post it up so that it is purely anonymous. And it is fascinating. Anyone who's on Instagram, just have a look at our Instagram. I think we're running it at the moment. Um, and it's everything from I'm putting 80%, 80% of my money into crypto, where we all just went, oh my God, like what on earth? To, to other people who are, you know, buying clothes from ASOS all the time, or they're overusing buy now, pay later, and all of these kind of tech enabled yeah, yeah. Um, financial vehicles because the whole way that these tools are built is to engage and to make you come back and back and get that dopamine hit and it's how they've been designed and that is quite I mean we're competing with the drug dealer right like it is quite difficult to catch the attention um Dom I've got one one question about whole institution approach um the the university sector and high, higher education and, and further education um have done a pretty good job in getting the mental health message to kind of filter through 
from the student support teams through kind of academic staff, tutors, into accommodation and the like. Um, we know, as we've just discussed, that, that mental health actually does encompass, you know, a, a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and yet bringing that whole institution approach can be really difficult. We know universities are incredibly siloed, even the ones that try to knock those down. What suggestions, practical um, kind of thoughts and ideas might you have about how the amazing student service and support people who are on this call might be able to engage with colleagues about this if this is something which is outside of the colleagues realm and the colleagues kind of role in day to day activity any any thoughts about how to engage that. Yeah, I mean okay so the first thing says it's taken years to shift the culture and we're not yet there because unfortunately I do still hear occasional negative stories from senior staff who do not accept how or understand how relevant you know mental health is to the success of their institution apart from anything else as well as the individual people staff and and students so uh, I think you know it can take years to shift culture so we're you know there are no quick answers for that although it is possible obviously I would say if, if you as an individual are wanting to kind of make a difference then it's absolutely fine to do things like invite yourself to their meetings so find out um, when relevant meetings are happening and go along and talk to you know departmental meetings or sort of um, you know multidisciplinary type meetings you know when they have uh, discussions about anything that might be relevant and say you know have you thought about the impact of um whether they're the exam boards or whether they're the you know timetable planning people or the accommodation people you know and how that interacts with with mental health and well-being and population-based approaches essentially to improving everybody's well-being or staff and students however you want to frame it so i'm i used to do <laughs> I used to do that just invite myself along to things and um just you know 10 minutes at the beginning just to say something and and actually yeah, slowly, you know, people started to say, oh, uh, our colleagues in English said you'd been along to their meeting, could you come along to history? Um, and the medical school started to sort of invite me along. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a much more piecemeal way to do it. But it's also a, maybe a more human and connected way to do it that, that will last longer than a, you know, here's a strategic approach and then just telling people this is what we're doing. So yeah, that would be one one thing that I definitely am a big fan of is 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 getting involved in other people's meetings. <laughs> yeah, sharp elbows. Yeah, something quite like a sharp elbow, right? Um, one of our hopes as we go into the new academic year is to run more sessions that are more across the institution, so that our kind of community can bring along people from accommodation, bring along people from admin, you know, and kind of start getting the conversation going um, in kind of the most nat natural and native way. So, um, so yes, sharp elbows, and apparently Dom can teach you how to push your way into places. So, you know, two for one yeah. rule, two for one games today. So. Um,